Welcome to our workshop on Oracle Database in Memory. My name is Maria Colgan and I'm the Product Manager for Oracle Database in Memory. In this first part of the workshop, I'll give you an overview of what you can expect from the in-memory functionality and where we see it benefiting different types of workloads and applications. As we go through the rest of the workshop, we'll dive into a lot more detail on how to configure and populate the column store as well as query it and how it's going to interact with the rest of the functionality within the Oracle database. Finally, in the last session then, we'll give you a deep dive on how the optimizer is fully in-memory aware and how in-memory interacts with the optimizer and how we decide to take advantage of it or not. At the end of each of the 45-minute presentations, we'll open the line up for Q&A. So if you have any questions as we go through the presentation, I'd ask you to hold those questions until we open the line up for Q&A. With that, why don't we get started? I thought it would be good if we could start by giving you some background on what motivated Oracle to introduce this new in-memory technology. The main motivation behind this new technology is the desire to give you the ability to do real-time analytics. Typically, analytical style queries are not executed until the data has migrated out of the operational systems and down into either a data warehouse or into a data mart. And what we're looking to do is give you the ability not only to run those analytical queries quickly in a data warehouse or in a data mart, but also sooner in the life cycle of the data, potentially even on the operational systems. Now, in that scenario, if you are going to run analytics on the operational system, we want to ensure that we don't impact the transactional workload on that operational system. So of course, that was a key factor we had in mind when we were designing this new technology. The other major driver for this technology was to ensure that all of the applications that have people have invested in and have spent time architecting against the Oracle database, that those applications wouldn't need to change. We want to make sure that it's incredibly easy for you to take advantage of this new technology, and therefore we wanted to make it easy to install and implement, but also ensure that no changes were required to your application. So what exactly do I mean by an analytical query? Well, they're the kind of queries that, as I said, you ask in your data warehouse environments, and they're ones that you ask when you're looking to perhaps change the way you're doing business. So for example, it might be a query that's trying to find out which products give us the highest margins or the high, highest profits. It may also be an investigation into your existing data set, looking for trends, things like what are the top sales representatives we've had in the Northwest region this month? Or they may be more what if style queries. What if I was to negotiate a higher discount on a particular product or widget that I use in the manufacturing of my product? How would that affect our margins going forward if I was able to get that type of discount? So there are a whole gamut of different types of queries, but we like to think of them as business driving queries. That's what we mean by analytic style queries. And if you wanted to break that down into SQL and you wanted to identify those types of queries within a given SQL workload, what they'd look like are they're going to be the type of queries that will scan a large amount of data. Well, scanning that data, they're not doing select stars from these tables. They're going to select a subset of the columns from these large tables. They'll use lots of filter predicates in the where clause of the queries, things that are use equalities or a range predicate of some kind, maybe a between, and in lists, things like that where we're going to have good filter predicates that will reduce the result set being returned to the end user. Obviously, being analytical style queries, they'll need to do some joins and aggregations. And we're expecting those joins to be of a selective nature. In other words, that after the join, this number of rows being returned will be smaller than the original result set. And of course, those complex aggregations, things like sums, averages, lead and lag operations, all of that type of stuff that requires us to do some type of aggregation or group by in the query. A really good example of, of a schema where analytical queries are typically executed, of course, is a star schema. Now, that doesn't mean the technology I'm about to describe won't work if you don't have a star schema, but it's just one good example or use case for it. 
before we get into what in memory is, let me give you a little bit of background about the design decisions that Oracle has made over the years. One of the biggest design decisions we've had to make is whether the Oracle database would be a row format database or a column format database. Now, as you know, Oracle did choose over 30 years ago to be a row format database. With a row format database, for each new record that's added to the database, a new row is added to a table. That row is made up of multiple columns, each column representing a different attribute about that record. Say, for example, we add a new customer to our database, then the new record or new row in the table would have a column that had the customer's name, another one with their address, another one with their email, and so on. As we recorded all of the attributes or pieces of information we had about that customer. The row format is incredibly efficient when you're doing transactional workloads. So for example, inserting a new customer, looking up an individual customer, updating a specific customer, or deleting or removing an existing customer. All of those row-based or transaction-based workloads will be very, very efficient in the row format. The alternative to the row format would have been to store the data in a column format. In a column format database, each of the attributes are stored in separate physical column structures. The column format is incredibly efficient if you're doing analytical style queries, because remember in an analytical query, we're only going to se select a subset of the columns, and we are going to look at those attributes for all of the records in the database. Therefore, the column format is a much more efficient way to do that because you only access the data that you need to answer the query. So why did Oracle choose to be a row format database? Well, what we discovered is that most of the transactions within a database are really those row level operations, inserting new rows, updating existing rows, deleting uh, existing rows. That tended to be the majority of the workload. And so we made a trade off. We made sure that the majority of the workload done in the database, all those row based operations would be incredibly fast but we did suffer some degradation in the analytical query performance by not choosing to be a columnar database. So how does the new technology help with this? Or in other words, what exactly is Oracle Database in Memory? With Oracle Database in Memory, you're now able to hold data in both a row and a column format simultaneously. When a query comes in, we look at that query and decide whether or not it's analytic in nature, in which case it will be sent to the column format, or if it's more transactional in nature, in which case it will go to the buffer cache just as it does today so that it'll be processed on the row format. What's unique about Oracle's approach is that there's only one format stored on disk. So there's no additional disk space required in order to take advantage of Oracle database in memory or data is persisted on disk in the traditional row format just as it was before. And the reason we've chosen to keep it exactly the same is so that any of the tools that you're using today to keep your system backed up or highly available, things like Ironman or DataGuard or Golden Gate, all of those tools are relying on Oracle's existing row format. And so we don't want to break any of those tools. What's also unique about Oracle's in-memory column format is the fact that we are keeping it simultaneously transactionally consistent. That means as soon as the data is changed, that the change will be reflected in both the row and the column format simultaneously. So if you were running queries against the column format in memory, you'd never get a different answer from the column store than you would if you were to run the same query against the row format in the buffer cache. Now you might be wondering how is Oracle doing that? And for now, I'd ask you to put that on hold. We will give you a lot more details about that in the third part of this workshop. But for now, let me just say that Oracle has always been able to keep our indexes transactionally consistent with our tables during any kind of DML or data change operation. And the same is true here with the column store. You can think about it keeping it in sync with the base table in the row format, just as we would keep an index in sync with a table. At the start of the presentation, I mentioned the fact that we were looking for in memory to help 
you do real-time analytics and bring the analytics sooner in the life cycle of the data. And one of the actual Global Leader members gave us a great example of where they would utilize in memory in this way, and that's the Starwood Hotel chain. At Starwood, they have a reservation system, and each time you book a hotel, a new record is added to that system. Once you arrive at the hotel and you check in, they update that record, and they'll update it one more time when you check out of the property. That reservation system holds critical business information for them, and that is how occupied a particular hotel is on a given night. They'd love to be able to run analytical queries against that reservation system in order to determine whether or not they need to discount certain rooms to ensure each of their properties is always profitable for every night. Today, they don't run those analytics until the reservation data has actually been migrated downstream to their enterprise warehouse. The reason they don't run it on the reservation system today is that it would require them to build additional indexes on that reservation system and of course maintaining those indexes every time somebody checked in or checked out of a hotel would be rather expensive and as you know none of us like to stand in front of the check-in or check-out counter for very long at a hotel so they don't do it. With Oracle Database in memory they're going to be able to get that performance they need on those analytical queries without having to create the indexes, really allowing them to do real-time analytics. So how does it work? How does in-memory work allowing them to get that analytic performance that they need without having to create indexes? Well, the first part of it is the way we store the data in this in-memory column store. When data is populated into the column store, two things are gonna happen. We're going to read the data in its row format, we'll pivot that data 90 degrees to create columns, and then we're going to compress that data. The data is going to be compressed using a brand new set of compression algorithms that we are not using anywhere else in the Oracle database. These compression algorithms differ from our existing ones in one key area. Obviously with compression it's all about saving space but these algorithms have a different focus. Their main focus is not saving space, it's actually query performance. And the reason for that is we want the compression format to be such that we can apply the where clause predicates of your queries directly to that compressed format and only decompress the data that is going to be returned to the end user. So we'll get two benefits from this design decision. Only access the columns we need for your queries because each column is now going to be stored separately in its own column structure, and then scan only the and then scan that data in its compressed format. So the volume of data we're reading will be far less. We'll only decompress the data that needs to be returned to the end user. How much compression can you expect to get? Anywhere from 2x to 20x compression can be expected. Now that's quite a wide range and that range of course depends on the compression level that you use but also on the data types that you've got and the data distribution. So certain data types, things like numerics and dates, tend to compress better than varchars or lobs and then of course the more repeated values you have in your data set the higher the compression ratio is bound to be. Another early adopter whose story I'd like to share with you is Schneider Electric. Now, they are specialists in energy management. They're based in France, in Europe, um, but they are worldwide. One of the places where I see their technology being used most actually is in hotel bathrooms. You go into a hotel bathroom, there's often a socket in the wall for a razor or an, a power outlet for a man's razor and in those bathrooms typically that socket is actually been manufactured by Schneider Electric. When they were trying out Oracle Database in Memory they wanted to be able to use it in conjunction with their general ledger application. They've got over 2 billion general ledger entries that are approximately 1 terabyte of size on disk and they tried each of the different compression levels that Oracle offers in memory to determine how much memory they were going to need to buy in order to be able to put this entire general ledger in memory and get the query performance that they wanted. So as I said, they tried each of the different levels and as you can see there, their compression ratio 
ranged from 8.6x with the default all the way up to 19x if they went with capacity high. And I'll give you a lot more details on all of these different compression levels and what guidance you need to choose one versus the other uh, when we get on to the next part of the workshop next week. So now we know how the data is populated in there and it's being held in memory. Why is it faster to scan data in the column store versus the buffer cache? After all, I could just pin all of the data from my tables into the buffer cache. Why would I go ahead and use in memory instead of just doing that? Well, it all comes down to how we access the data when it comes to running your queries. So I wanted to give you a little example. Here what I've got is a table called my table. It's made up of four columns. I've placed my table both in the buffer cache and in the column store and we're going to run the same query against both versions of the table so that you can see exactly what's going to happen when we execute the query. So the query is very straightforward. Select column four from my table. Now in this first part we're going to look at it what happens in the buffer cache when that query gets executed the first thing we're going to do is find the first database block that makes up my table and inside of that database block we're going to look for the offset of the first row and then we're going to walk along that row until we get to column four. We're going to pick up the value we're interested in, jump to the offset of the next row, continue to walk along that till we get to column four, pluck out the value that we need, jump to the offset of the next row and so on and so forth until we get to the end of the table. So as you can see, we read quite a bit of data trying to extract the values that we were interested in. If I issue that same query, but this time having my table within the column store, then what you'll find, because each of the columns in the table are stored separately, we'll go directly to column four. We'll only read column four. We won't read any of the other columns in the table and we'll extract out the values that we need to answer the query. So as you can see there, the volume of data being accessed is far less in the column store than it is in the buffer cache. Because of course, not only am I only accessing the column that I need, I'm accessing that column in a compressed format. But there's a lot more to the column store than simply just avoiding scanning unnecessary columns. Each of the columns within the column store has its own storage index. Now, a lot of you are familiar with the storage index concept from Exadata, and we are using a very similar strategy within the in-memory column store, but there are a couple of small differences. For example, on Exadata, only eight columns within a table can benefit from having a storage index. Within in-memory, every column in the table has that storage index automatically created and maintained on it. Now, what I haven't told you so far is that when we read the data into the in-memory column store, we actually break it up into in-memory extents or in-memory compression units is what we actually call them, often referred to as IMCUs. The storage index is maintained at an IMCU level. So what we'll actually do is when we're coming to scan a particular column in a table, we'll first look at the storage index, determine which IMCUs need to be scanned and then only read those IMCUs in order to answer the query. So let's look at an example to, so that I can explain it more clearly to you. Let's say we have a table called sales that's been populated into the in-memory column store. We are looking for all of the sales we had in our stores where the store ID is eight. We'll go directly to the store ID column of the sales table. And then before we start scanning any data, we'll use the storage index to determine which IMCUs need to be scanned. If we look at the min-max range for the store ID in the first IMCU, you'll notice there that the min value is one, the max value is three. So there are definitely no store IDs that are eight in that particular IMCU. So let's look at the second IMCU, min value four, max value seven. So again, there are no store IDs that are eight in that IMCU, so we can simply skip it. If we move on to the third IMCU, you'll see there it has a min value of eight and a max value of 12. So we're definitely gonna have some store IDs that are eight, so we'll definitely need to scan that particular IMCU. 
But what about the fourth one? The fourth IMCU for the table has a min value of 7 and a max value of 15. What do you think? Should I scan it? Well, the answer is maybe. I know the value 8 falls between that min-max range, but I don't know if there are actually any store IDs with the value 8 in that IMCU. Now, on Exadata, we'd simply scan that IMCU or that extent uh, and check for 8s. Within memory, we add an additional level of smartness to the storage index. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to take advantage of the dictionary that was created when we compressed or encoded this data in the column store. So inside of the metadata for each of the IMCUs, we keep that dictionary or the encoding dictionary, which is a list of the distinct values for that column in that IMCU. We'll look in the dictionary. If we find the value 8, then we know for sure we need to scan this IMCU because one or more entries has the value 8. If we don't find the value 8 in the dictionary, then we can simply skip that IMCU because even though our value falls between the min-max range, we know for certain via the dictionary that there are no values 8 in that particular IMCU. The other way we're able to improve the performance of queries when they're accessing data in the column store versus the buffer cache is by taking advantage of something called SIMD vector processing. Now, a lot of people think when they hear data is being compressed and stored in a column format that this in-memory format would be identical to HCC compression that you get on Exadata. And in fact, the two formats are completely different. And they're different because our format in memory, the compressed format in memory, has been specifically designed in order to be able to take advantage of this SIMD vector processing. So let me explain what that is. Vector processing isn't new. It's certainly not something Oracle invented or any of our competitors. It's actually something that got created to help with supercomputing in the late 60s, early 70s. But we are going to take great advantage of it here with the in-memory column store because it's going to allow us to process multiple entries from a column in a single CPU instruction instead of having to go one entry at a time. So let me explain how we're going to do that. You'll notice there that our sales table is in memory and a query is going to come in that says find all of the sales we had in the region of California. So again, I go straight to the regions column because that's what was being used in the where clause predicate. And I'm going to need to scan that column looking for all of the entries that are California. Now I could go entry by entry asking each one at a time, are you California? If the answer is yes, I'd hang on to the value. If the answer is no, I would jump to the next value and so on. Or I could evaluate a set of values from the regions column in a single CPU instruction by loading that set of entries into the SIMD register on the CPU and then processing all of those entries in a single CPU instruction. Hanging on to anybody who, where the answer of region equal California is true disregarding any of the values where it's not true. What do you think would be faster? Entry by entry or doing this set processing of evaluating multiple entries from the region column in that single CPU instruction? And you'd be right, doing the set processing is far more efficient. And it's so efficient, in fact, it allows us to be able to do billions of rows per second per CPU core. Now, if you're looking to compare that against what Oracle can do today in the buffer cache, we can do tens of millions of rows per second per CPU core within the buffer cache. So about a factor of 100x performance improvement. Now, analytical queries don't just scan data. They also do joins. And we're taking advantage of the same technology that helps speed up joins on Exadata, which of course is a Bloom filter that's going to help us speed up the joins in the column store by basically converting those joins into operations that the column store is good at, which is scanning and filtering data. Just in case there's anybody on the call who's not familiar with how the Bloom filter technology works, let me give you a quick recap. 
In this example here, I'm doing a two table join between the stores and the sales table because I'm looking for the total sales we had in our outlet stores. Oracle's gonna start processing this query by scanning the smaller of the two tables first. Instead of reading all of the data, we're gonna just go directly to the column that's used in the where clause predicate, and that would be the type column. And we'd apply the predicate type is equal to outlet using that SIMD vector processing. Once we find any entries where the type is equal to outlet, we'll pick up the corresponding store ID from the store ID column. Now store ID is the join column between these two tables. And in this query, the result comes back from the store table saying the store IDs will be 15, 38, and 64. And using those three values, we're gonna create an additional filter predicate on the sales table that we'll pass as a predicate to the scan of that sales table. So you can envision it as where the sales store ID is in 1538 or 64. So when we come to scanning the sales table, we'll start with the store ID column. We'll apply the filter predicate where store ID is in 1538 or 64. And each time we find a match, we'll pick up the corresponding amount from the amounts column. By the time we're finished scanning the sales table, we'll have the total amount of sales for our outlet stores. No need to do a subsequent join operation after the scan. We'll only have returned values from the sales table where we know the store type was equal to outlet. By converting the join into an operation that the in-memory column store is good at, we're able to speed up the joins by about a factor of 10x. There is another part to analytical queries and it's typically aggregation. Oftentimes analytical queries will have things like a sum or a count distinct or an average or a min or a max. And all of those types of functions or aggregation functions are going to require a group by. Now traditionally Oracle has offered two types of group by, a sort group by and a hash group by. Well, we're introducing a third one with Oracle database in memory. We call it a vector group by or in memory aggregation. And what that's going to allow us to do is actually do the group by as part of the scan of the fact table. So instead of waiting for all of the tables to be scanned and filtered, then joined and only aggregated or grouped at the very end, we're now going to do the group by much earlier in the execution plan. We'll do it actually as part of the scan of the sales table. So let me explain to you how we're going to do that. We're going to be able to do it by taking advantage of something called an in-memory accumulator or an in-memory report outline. Now that accumulator or outline is stored in the PGA for the lifetime of the query. And here's how it gets built. Let's say we're doing a three table join between our products, our stores and our sales table because we're trying to find the total sales we had for our footwear products in our outlet stores. Well, we're gonna start by scanning the two smaller dimension tables, products and stores. We'll apply the where clause predicates to those tables and extract out the different types of footwear products and the different outlet stores. Using that information, we're gonna create a multi-dimensional array in the PGA that's gonna be this accumulator or report outline. Now, because I've only got two dimensions, you can envision that multi-dimensional array as a spreadsheet. It's a two-dimensional array in this fact. Across the top of the spreadsheet, you've listed your different types of footwear. Down the left-hand side of the spreadsheet, the different outlet stores. Now, when we begin the scan of the sales table, we're going to use similar technology to the Bloom filters to only pick out entries from the sales table where the product type is footwear and the store type is outlet. And each time we find a match in the sales table, what we're going to do is put the corresponding amount from that sale into the appropriate cell on the spreadsheet for that particular type of footwear for that particular outlet store. We'll continue to scan down the sales table when we come across another entry that happens to be for that particular type of footwear in that outlet store, we simply add the existing value that we're getting from the table to the value that's already in that cell on the spreadsheet so that by the time I finish scanning the sales table, 
the spreadsheet actually holds the total amount of sales that we had for our different footwear products in our different outlet stores. By simply returning the result of that spreadsheet to the end user, we're actually returning the result of the query, allowing us to do the aggregation as part of the scan and greatly speed up the execution of the query. Now, what's really nice about this new vector group by is that not only can we offload the group by as part of a scan of a table that's in memory, if I've got a much larger table where not all of it's going to be in memory and some of it's going to be out on Exadata, we're able to offload the group by or uh, key vector scan also to the Exadata storage. So you can get benefit in both places. So how much benefit should you expect from all of these different optimizations with the in-memory column store? Well, if we go back and look at Schneider again, remember they had 2 billion general ledger entries, about one terabyte worth of data. They populated it into the in-memory column store and they, they ran about 1,500 different queries on that data. Now, they had populated the data into the buffer cache as well as the in-memory column store. They ran all 1,500 queries and they compared the elapsed times. As you can see, they got anywhere from 7x to 128x performance improvement. Now, you might be wondering why is there such a big difference in the performance improvement? Why would some queries benefit more than others? Well, the in-memory column store isn't going to speed up every aspect of the query. Remember, the main part that it speeds up is the scan and filter operations within the query, as well as some of the joins and the aggregation aspects. So depending on the query, some queries will see more benefit than others. If you wanted to know what it was like to compare the in-memory column store to commodity storage on disk, so this is not Exadata, there's no smart storage here, it is just simple commodity storage, what you'll find there is they saw anywhere from 62x to over 3000x performance improvement. Now, take that with a grain of salt. Remember, memory access is always about 10 times faster than disk access, so this might be a slightly unfair comparison, but just if you can get a, a general sense of the performance benefit they saw, because of course, they didn't have enough memory to have everything in the buffer cache on their actual production system, so that's why they ran this one, because this would be a true comparison of what their end users could expect. Now, at the very beginning, I mentioned the fact that we would like you to be able to run analytics, not just in a data warehouse quickly, but also in an operational or OLTP environment. So how is it going to be impacted with this introduction of analytics? Well, there are a lot of systems today that are actually doing this, where they're running analytics or reports, as well as transactions. And if you look inside those systems, what you'll actually find is that for each of the tables involved in the application, there'll be two different types of indexes created on those objects. The first set, or the smaller set, are typically the primary key, foreign key indexes, the indexes that are being created for referential integrity within the application. The second or larger set are analytical indexes. These are indexes that have been specifically created to speed up a particular report. Now, the number of those analytical indexes can be anywhere from 10 to 20 to even 100 indexes, depending on how many reports you've had and what your particular tuning techniques have been. If you simply create a new index for every report that's created on the system, then you could have quite a large number of indexes. Now, what's the impact of having all of those analytical indexes? Well, of course, they're going to make the reports run quickly, but the transaction system may be impacted by them because we're going to have to maintain all of those indexes every time we do a DML operation on the system. And I wanted to just show you some results of a quick experiment that I did. I have a single table. I start with just one index and I measured how many rows I could insert a second on that table. So as you can see, when I only have a single index, I can get over 6,000 inserts per second. But as the number of indexes increase, and I only went up as far as nine, I got a serious drop off in the insertion rate. I was down to less than a thousand inserts per second once I had over nine indexes. Now, if you can imagine how that graph might look, 
if I had perhaps 20 or 50 or even 100 indexes on that table. It would be very, very slow to do any type of DML. So what we're suggesting is that if you are going to be in a mixed workload environment, one where you're running transactions and analytics or reporting queries at the same time, that you keep the indexes that are needed for referential integrity. So your primary key foreign key indexes remain the same just as they are today, but you replace those reporting indexes and use the in-memory column store. Now that's going to give you a lot of benefits. Most obvious one being is that you'll get the exact same performance that you're getting today for any of the reports that you run today, but any new report that you add to the system will also get good performance without the necessity of having to create those new indexes. You'll also have to do a lot less tuning and administration because the optimizer isn't going to suffer from index confusion. Once we get rid of all those indexes, you'll no longer have to be woken up in the middle of the night being told the optimizer is suddenly picking the wrong index, what's going on. But you'll also won't have to rebuild any of those indexes that are becoming fragmented over time. So it should get you back a lot more time uh, on, as administrators of these systems as well. How much benefit can I get by removing those indexes for the transactions? Well, again, we'll go back to Schneider. They shared with us some great results. What you see here is the number of transactions they can process per day based on the number of rows that are in the table. So this red line is the baseline. That's what their performance looks like today when they have all 21 secondary indexes plus the primary key on their general ledger table. That's how their life looks today. Then they ran two experiments. The first one was removing all secondary indexes. So remove all 21 secondary indexes, only keep the primary key index. And that's what you see there with the blue line. That's the number of transactions they could process during the day. The green line is the second experiment. And what that indicates is what happens when I keep the primary key index and I add the in-memory column store. As you can see, the green line and the blue line mirror each other, and they're both far better than what you can get with all 21 indexes. And so the overhead of keeping that in-memory column store consistent is nowhere near as expensive as trying to maintain all 21 indexes. The other key advantage we got with Schneider when we removed those indexes was that we were able to seriously reduce the footprint of the database. Now, not all of that gained was be just because of the indexes themselves, we actually got the biggest gain when we removed the um, redo and undo of having to maintain all of those indexes during that DML. So they saw about a 70% reduction in their storage capacity for the database without the analytical indexes. So what about scaling this solution? It all sounds pretty good, but I've got a large data set. How am I gonna scale it? Well, if you're in a rack environment, what's going to happen is Oracle will scale out the solution. When you mark a table in memory in a rack environment, we're actually going to break that table up into pieces. We'll put a different piece of the table on each of the rack nodes so that when a query comes in, we send a different process out to each of the rack nodes. They'll execute the query on that piece of the data and they return the results to a query coordinator will aggregate up the results and return them to the end user. By distributing an object across the cluster in this manner, not only are we able to increase the capacity of our column store um, linearly by just adding more nodes to the rack environment, but we're also able to improve the performance of the query by utilizing the CPU resources across the cluster. Now, obviously, a lot of the folks on the call today are running on Exadata, and with the latest version of the Exadata storage software, we're going to be able to take advantage of direct-to-wire InfiniBand protocols. This is where we're going to be able to communicate across the rack cluster without having to go through the seven network layers of the operating system. The Oracle kernel will be able to talk directly um, to the InfiniBand protocol, and again, on the other side, when we're sending messages and receiving them, we'll be able to pick up the message directly from the wire without having to go through all of those layers within the operating system. So making it very, very efficient to do this type of scale out solution on an Exadata environment. 
One of the customers who's taken full advantage of running Oracle database in memory in a rack environment is Yahoo. Each time you log into Yahoo, they run a sub-second marketing auction in the background among their advertisers looking to see who would like to place their ad on your particular page. So for example, when I log into my Yahoo email, there's always an advertisement there on the right hand side for shoes. I buy a lot of shoes online um, and Yahoo knows me well. And so they're easily able to run that auction without having to do too much digging to figure out what would be a good ad to place on my page. If, however, I was more security conscious, uh, for example, like my husband who works in IT security, there would be very few breadcrumbs in my session in order for uh, Yahoo to be able to determine who I am and what ad should be placed on my page. And in that case, they'd need to run a lot of analytics to be able to offer the advertisers some kind of incentive to bid to place their ad on my page. And that's what they're using in memory for, to run those analytics in sub-second response times so that they're able to run the auction with some useful information and be able to place the appropriate ad on the right person's page. What if my data set is too large to fully fit inside the column store? Even with the data compression, what if I couldn't fit everything I wanted into the column store? Well, that's not a problem. Oracle's able to seamlessly scale your solution both across memory, flash, and disk simultaneously. We're able to have a single query access data on all three levels of storage without you needing to change anything about your query or the application. We'll take care of it automatically for you. So when a query comes in, we'll pick up as much of the data as we can from the in-memory column store. If we can't get it all from there, then we go to the buffer cache, to the flash cache, and then of course to disk in order to be able to answer your query. So you don't need to do anything. There's no problem moving data in and out of the column store down into flash and then onto disk as it gets older. So giving you that full ability to tier your data in order of importance or performance criticality. Now, one of the things that's really nice about embedding this solution of the column store into the Oracle database is that it allows you to continue to keep your system highly available just as you do today. So whether you're using Rack or ASM to um, keep your system available or whether you're using Arman or DataGuard or Golden Gate to replicate your system somewhere else, all of that technology will work exactly the same as it does today. There's no issues there, everything will work even though you're taking advantage of the in-memory column store. Now, one of the things you might have realized in when I was describing how our scale-out solution works is the fact that the data is now distributed across the rack cluster, effectively in a shared nothing style architecture. So what happens if one of the rack nodes fails? Well, if one of the rack nodes fails, the data that was populated in that column store will have to be read either from the buffer cache or from disk on the remaining nodes. Now, if that's something you can't tolerate, if you want to make sure that you always have exactly the same performance from all of your queries, regardless of whether a rack node has failed or not, then you may want to take advantage of Oracle's in-memory mirroring. Now, this is very similar to what we do on disk. Um, just like on disk, we're going to keep two copies of the data in memory. So for each of the IMCUs, remember they're the in-memory extents that we create in the column store, we'll mirror that across the rack nodes. So if one rack node goes down, we'll simply read from the other side of the mirror, allowing us to get all of the data from the column store at all times. So how easy is it to get started with Oracle Database in memory? It's actually very simple. First thing you need to do is allocate some memory to this new column store, and you do that by setting a new in a .or parameter called in memory size. Next, you need to identify which tables or partitions you'd like to place in memory, and you can simply do that with an alter table uh, modify partition or alter table command and specify the in memory attribute on those objects. After that, Oracle will automatically take care of populating those objects into that column store and directing your queries to take advantage of that new columnar format. All you need to do then 
is to get rid of any of the analytical indexes you may have created in that mixed workload environment, allowing you to be able to not only shrink the size of your database, but also speed up the processing of your transactions because you're never, no longer going to have to maintain those indexes. If you don't take my word for it, you can ask Ritman Mead, one of the partners for the Global Leaders. Mark Ritman was part of the beta program and we asked him at the end of it, what did you think? How easy was it to use? And Mark gave us a great quote. He said, in terms of how easy it is to use, it was almost boring. It just worked. You turn it on, you select the tables, and there's nothing else you need to do. Now, because the in-memory technology is embedded into the Oracle database, it means that we are fully functional with all of the other tools and technologies that you're used to using in Oracle database. So for example, using partitioning, parallel execution, flashback query, even the new multi-tenant that's in uh, 12C, all of that functionality is completely uh, compatible with in-memory. There's no issues or problems using the in-memory column store with any of those features and functionalities. So what's the catch? Well, let me tell you this. In-memory is not going to speed up absolutely everything. There are certain types of workloads that it really works well for, and that is those analytical data accesses. So it's really, really good at scanning and filtering data. It's not going to help you if your application has problems with network round trips because you're, you're constantly logging on and logging off the database, or if you spend too much time parsing, or if you've got complex functions in PL SQL where you manipulate the data after it's been extracted from the database. If you're doing anything like that, if that's where your problems lie, the in-memory column store is not suddenly going to speed those up. It's only really good at doing one thing well, it's really, really good at scanning and filtering data. Now, in order to get the full benefit from in memory, there's also a couple of other things that you need to do. You need to make sure that you are actually processing the data in the database. If your application connects to the Oracle database, does a select star from a table, drags the data into the mid tier and then manipulates it, you're not gonna see a whole lot of benefit from Oracle database in memory either. Another problem is if your application asks for just one row from the database and then manipulates it in memory uh, on the mid-tier, again, you're not going to see any benefit from the column store there. You want to make sure that you're building your business logic into your SQL statements and that you're processing those on the Oracle database so that we're scanning and doing all of the filtering as part of the execution of your queries. Then you'll get the biggest bang from your book from in memory. The optimizer plays a big part in this, so you are going to have to make sure you still have a good set of optimizer statistics in order to be able to take advantage of it. And you're also going to need to use parallel execution in order to make sure that we are accessing large volumes of data as quickly as possible. Where can you get more information about Oracle Database in Memory? Well, we've got a ton of different resources for you depending on what type of format you want. So with that, let's open the phone lines for some Q&A and let us answer any questions you may have on Oracle Database and Memory.